and welcome to episode two of Join the Dots. I'm Cam Sandhu. I'm Ranjan Balakumaran. We're back to discuss another term. We discussed deregulation in episode one, so if you haven't caught that, you can find that on our YouTube channel. This time, we're sticking with the, with the theme of housing and we're talking about geographical displacement, why and how it's created within our housing system. But before we dive into that, we don't have a universal housing system in the UK, do we? No, universal housing policy, no. Uh, there's the idea of universal health, universal education, um, social security system, but I don't think universal housing has been done here or anywhere else. And um, this is a question that we put to poet, potent whisper, who we're gonna hear from now. Here's what he had to say. Well, this country views um, housing as a commodity and not a human right. Um, and I think actually it's that viewpoint, that kind of general consensus, which I don't even think is there, that housing is an asset, is something that, you know, people don't deserve. It isn't a human right. It, you know, that seems to be like the public narrative um, in this country. Um, but of course, that's the official narrative and not the narrative of everybody on the street, everybody living on the estates, everybody who, who truly has a heart um, does believe that housing is a human right. Um, it's not, you know, being treated that way because, of course, people want to make money, you know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of money to be made um, in housing and land. So that was Potent Whisper talking about why we don't have a universal housing system in the UK. And I think he raised something that will come up again and again in this episode about the official narrative, what politicians are saying about housing, the terminology that they're using, and the difference between that and the reality that's happening for people on housing estates and for people trying to get onto the housing ladder. Yeah, well, it's, there's, a, there's a kind of taboo, isn't there, which is that geographical displacement is happening and that there's this gap between the idea of universal housing and homelessness, and it's filled by moving people out of the local authority where they live out to somewhere else. Mm. And we very much know that it is happening. In 2015, between 2012 and 2015, 50,000 uh, social housing tenants were moved out of London um, into other parts of the UK on housing estates that we've been to. We did a film called A Social Cleansing in 2015 uh, where the tenants on West Hendon Estate were talking about how they were being shipped off or told that their options were Hastings and Birmingham um, and places where outside of London. It's also something that's come up in Grenfell, residents complaining that they're being offered, uh, well, there'd had to be a lot of public pressure to fight for those residents to remain in the borough where they live. Um, we're going to bring a couple of examples of the kind of ways that the official narrative is, is out of sync with the reality and how geographical displacement is happening underneath it. But before that, here's Vicky Cooper, lecturer in criminology, talking about what geographical displacement means. Currently, under this austerity period, um, not only are we seeing a rise in the number of evictions and a rise in the number of temporary accommodation and a rise in the number of homelessness, in order for local councils to cope with um, a dwindling housing stock and rise in the number of homeless people and homeless households, they're sending homeless families outside of the council areas. They're sending families not to the neighbouring council areas, but they're sending families to, di to, to completely different cities. And this is especially happening in London because they're, because the, the, the there's a huge lack of affordable housing within, within councils. We call this geographical displacement, this, this act of sending homeless families out of um, their home communities. Um, geographical displacement on record last year, and this is only on record, this is only what we know about, um, because a lot of people will leave cities voluntarily. Um, there were 20,000 households recorded as being geographically displaced from their, from their local authority area. In London, lots of families have been moved to Basingstoke, to Manchester, to Birmingham and to Hull as well. Um, now, what that means is for children especially, first and foremost for children, they have to move, they have to leave their school. Uh, for the adults, they have to leave their families, they have to leave their, their support networks. Um, so it has all sorts of physical and psychological effects on, on their well-being when they leave their home communities. So that was Vicky Cooper explaining what geographical displacement means. 
moving on to a couple of examples that we wanted to highlight about the kind of policies that the Conservative government have pursued on housing recently. Um, we had Boris Johnson, ex-mayor, who said actually in 2014 that you, we weren't going to see a social cleansing happening in London, that we wouldn't see people uprooted, and yet it was his redefinition of affordable housing that has excluded uh, lots of low-income people from the housing debate because he set affordability at up to 80% of market rents. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's the abuse of language and statistics in order to further the cause of the developers. Instead of putting the buyer at the centre of the debate and saying, well, it's affordable because you can afford to buy it, uh, instead it's putting the seller, the developer, at the centre. It's providing an excuse for the developer to build as much as they like and the thing that they call affordable that will justify local people being able to buy is an outright lie because no local person would be able to afford that. Yeah, and he, the OECD actually in 2014 said that um, rents in London were 30% above what is economically justifiable. So Johnson using market rents uh, as the kind of bar barometer and putting it at 80% when we have obviously increases in zero hour contracts, low pay, people in increasingly insecure work is, is not helping people at all. It's actually quite a cruel description to say that this is affordable housing. Now there's another example that we wanted to bring in and talk about how these interact with each other. Uh, this time we're talking about a kind of rhetoric that's been pursued by the Conservatives after adopting it from a think tank. Yes, Alex Morton wrote uh, a policy paper for a policy exchange in which he talked about expensive social housing. So just as Boris Johnson talked about affordable housing being something that anyone could afford, when in actual fact they can't, it's just an excuse for developers, Alex Morton talked about expensive social housing and he said the public don't like expensive social housing. They want everyone to be housed but not in expensive social housing. So he said it's roughly £177,000, the average house price in the UK. This was five years ago. So, for example, in the North East, no one needs to be moved out mm -hmm. of where they live because the average house price there is less than that. Whereas in somewhere like Kensington, the average price at the time, I think, was £781,000. So it's just not justifiable for anyone to live in social housing there. That was really how he was approaching the situation. And he actually said in that paper that most people would... Um most of the public would support kicking these social housing tenants out of these areas. Of course, what makes a house uh, more expensive, the biggest factor will be location. And so this is, underneath it, suggesting that we should have these enclaves where rich people should be allowed to live and you aren't allowed to go there. Yeah, good point. I mean, it's opening the door to, I suppose, social cleansing or um, a, a policy of, yeah, just stuffing one place with one type of person. And it's worth... Uh, mentioning we did an interview this week with uh, Till from Transparify and he noted that Policy Exchange was one of the three least transparent think tanks in the UK and yet the Conservative Party have been adopting a lot of their policies. We mentioned them a little bit in extras if you caught that. Um, but now we're going to go to Anna Minton, author of new book Big Capital, Who is London For? And she's talking about how Alex Morton justifies this idea of fairness. Here she is. The previous government um, where um, Alex Morton was housing advisor, Alex Morton who'd previously been at Policy Exchange, had this notion of fairness, which was a very funny notion of fairness. Uh, and that notion of fairness went something like, if you don't have enough money, you shouldn't, uh, you can't afford to live in the most expensive part of London. Therefore, it's not fair that you live there. So I suspect that's what he was getting at when he said the public don't like expensive social housing. It was this notion somehow of fairness that if you can't afford to live in Kensington, why was it fair that you were able to live in subsidised housing in Kensington? Well, I mean, it depends on whether or not you believe in a city which is mixed and socially balanced and diverse, or whether you want to see a hollowed out London where only very wealthy people can live in the city. That's certainly where we're moving towards, and I don't think many of the public are happy with that either. That was Anna Minton talking about the way in which 
expensive social housing is used as an excuse to justify moving poor people out of uh, what used to be poor neighbourhoods. This is Paul Watt talking about the same thing but from the perspective of the neighbourhood effect. Well, the neighbourhood effect, it goes back to the 1990s, I think that's when it first came about, and it was the idea then that if you look at US inner city areas, say for example the south side of Chicago or the Bronx in New York, the idea is that, uh, that people are poor in those areas um, and that it's not simply that they're poor because of their individual characteristics, that they might be unemployed, that they might be on a low income. It's also that there's an additional effect over and above that of the individuals themselves. There's a collective effect of them living together within a neighborhood. And the idea then of the neighborhood effect is then that it's also passed on to the kind of the, the children, if you like, of the, of, the, of the residents of that area. So in other words then, one of the reasons then why it is then that children growing up in poor neighborhoods, that they might struggle, they might themselves then wind up being poor, is not simply because of the individual characteristics of their parents, it's also because the fact that the, they're clustered together in the same space together. So, it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's a spatial effect over and above that of all of the individual effects of them being in poverty. Um, the, the, what then, as a result of that idea then, the argument then came from US urban policy, was that in order to break the neighbourhood effect, you had to spatially deconcentrate the poor. And in relationship then to US public housing, the projects, what it meant then is the idea that essentially, putting it crudely, uh, you had to knock down the existing public housing, the projects, and then spatially disperse the, um, the residents. If you move them then out to more uh, mixed tenure areas, then they will benefit because they will no longer be clustered in that, in that space. That was Paul Watt talking about the neighbourhood effect, which he goes on to say has been utterly discredited because the middle class role models who move into the area, in fact, very often don't interact with their new neighbours and go on to blame them for everything that they feel is bad about the area. And yet these social housing tenants are also meant to feel grateful about the regeneration process that's taken place and these new residents who don't interact with them. Um, I guess you'd think that following the Grenfell fire, the disaster which is still unfolding, Councils across the UK would perhaps take a moment to pause and think about what's happening with our housing system and our housing policy. And yet when we went down to Haringey on Monday, we found that the Labour Council there was going full steam ahead on the Haringey development deal, which is a £2 billion sell-off of public assets to the notorious Lend-Lease. We spoke to Emmett when we were down there, who has gone through the experience of eviction and here he is telling us his story. I got 13 days notice of my eviction. I've been in this flat for seven years. I had lots of storage so I could have my things unpacked. And now all my stuff has gone to storage. Now I can't afford to pay for the storage, but I have to because I'm a, I've done a couple of maths degrees and I need all my, my mathematics stuff from those degrees. I'm trying to, would like to be at the moment doing a PhD in mathematics, but I've, because of having nowhere to live, I've not been able to work on the proposal. And um, it, 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 it's just it's turned my life upside down. I mean, so I've been staying on friend's sofas, I've been sleeping rough, I've been just doing whatever I can to survive. I've been attacked, I've been had really serious injuries done to me, and it's just, my life has been hell. It's been hell ever since October. All the people living there when I was there were all in social housing. There'll be no social housing in this. Even there was going to be no affordable housing. No affordable housing is £400,000. Not affordable to anyone that I know. But there wasn't even going to be any of that. Because apparently in order for them to be able to make a profit, this company was so incompetent that they had to have only sold to basically the international super rich to use it for uh, land banking, hoarding money, money laundering, and Airbnb with no one to have any local roofs. Lendlease is one of the worst companies you can imagine doing it. I think any responsible company would never have done it. But Lendlease are the most irresponsible company you can imagine. Uh, the record on employment rights, the record on trade union rights, the record on environmental rights, and that we've just had Grenfell, you know. The idea this is that 
you can just send things to the public, to the private sector, and therefore they will be looked after, is not true. That was Emmett, who should be doing a PhD in mathematics. You'd have thought somebody like that would be a maths teacher or something like that, but instead this is how we're treating him. We asked Anna Minton, who is London for? London is for the foreign investor these days, ploughing large amounts of capital into safety deposit boxes in the sky. Mm -hmm.